told your friends goodbye, then you flew away. You said you had to leave to go prepare a place. So the way you are, we may also be. Now there's a world full of doubters, but I believe this could be the day we meet you in the sky. Hour. We will be like you in the twinkling of an eye, caught up by your power. For the sun, it's going down on the day of grace. Oh, in any moment now, we could see your face. I know it's not your will that any be left. Jesus, help me change some parts in life. Cause they run unbelief like the spear shoves through your side. The Lord, it cuts so deep that it makes me wanna cry. Cause this could be the day we meet you in the sky. This could be the hour. Taught us to be looking for the end of the age, and your hand through history has been turning every day. Now this could be the day we meet you in the sky. This could be the hour we will be like you in the twinkling of an eye, ordered by your power. This could be the day we meet you in the sky. This could be the hour We will be like you In the twinkling of an eye Caught up by your power Oh, the sun, it's going down On the day of grace The sun, it's going down On the day of grace Oh, the sun, it's going down On the day of grace See your face. Hello, my name is Fred Trokey. Last week, we learned about positional truth in regard to our relationship with Jesus Christ. Today, we are going to continue on this subject. Romans 6, verses 3 through 4 says... Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism and death, just that, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also can walk in newness of life. The Apostle Paul indicates that a certain knowledge is required in order to understand this teaching. In ignorance, there can be no victory. Believers need to know and understand the words, as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Clearly, baptized here is not referring to water baptism, but rather to spiritual baptism. Without spiritual baptism, the believer has no position in Christ. Baptism is, baptism is performed by God in order to identify an individual into that which he is spiritually being baptized into. In this passage, the Christian is baptized in, into Christ and therefore identified with him in a certain way. Specifically, the believer has been baptized into Christ's death. The believer has forever died to the sin principle and positionally, the believer is seen as having died when Christ died 2,000 years ago on a cross outside of Jerusalem. According to verse 4, 
A new kind of life results from the believer's identification with Christ's death and burial. Indeed, a co-death and co-burial with Christ is necessary in order to be co-resurrected with him. Each and every true believer is identified with the person of Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's talk about identification for a moment. As humans, all through our lives, we are being identified. We, have, we all have names, and our names identify not only, not o- identify not only as to uh, who we are, but also to which family we belong to. Our names are positional. No matter what we do, we will always have our names. When a woman marries a man, she normally takes the man's last name to be her own. She is now identified as legally being his wife. Identification is used for many different reasons. One of the major purposes of of identification is in regards to access. Work-related access, for example, may be restricted to only certain individuals. Identification verifies and gives authorization to enter into areas that normally would be restricted. Being identified with Christ, therefore, gives the believer complete access to all of the positional benefits that are available in Christ, which includes Christ's death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. Identification with Christ's resurrection is basic for living the Christian life. The phrase, raised from the dead, clearly refers to Christ's physical, bodily resurrection. Positionally, then, the believer participated with Christ, having been been baptized into the body of Christ. The statement that Christ was raised by the glory of the Father indicates the the source of the power for the resurrection. The word newness indicates that this is a new kind of life that the believer is identified with as a result of of spiritual baptism. Romans 6, 5-7 says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. The results of positional death are expressed in verses 5 and 6. Several elements are explained in these two verses. First, in verse 5, the Apostle Paul presents the unification of the believer with the death and resurrection of Christ. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. The word if could actually be rendered as since, and the word when the word united shows the close relationship of the death and burial of the Lord Jesus to the position of the believer in Christ. Here, the word speaks of that vital union of the, of the believing sinner and the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus mentioned back in verses 3 and 4, where God places him or her into, into Christ at the cross to share his death and resurrection. The word likeness in verse 5 means resemblance, which amounts to identification. The believer then is recognized as having been identified with Christ's death. Therefore, the believer also shall be identified with Christ's resurrection. The logical outgrowth of being identified with the death of Christ is to be identified with his resurrection also. The truth of the believer's identification with the death and resurrection of Christ sets up, Paul, sets up Paul's next statement found in verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. The phrase old man is referring to the person as viewed from the perspective of his unsaved state. At the point of salvation, because of one's identification with Christ's death, 
the, un, the old unsaved person that was crucified. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that we, are new, that we are new creation in Christ and that the old things have passed away, which includes our old sin nature having the ability to have control over us. By the phrase, the body of sin, Paul means the physical body, which is the instrument through which the sin principle operates. The phrase, body of sin, denotes the body belonging to or ruled by the power of sin, in which the members of the body are instruments of unrighteousness. The body itself is not inherently sinful, but provides the outlet for our flesh to operate. Functionally, the word body means that the abilities to act consistently with the, either the old nature or the new nature, while the phrase body of sin views, views the physical body as being available for the old nature to control us. The apostle is not stating that the physical body will be eliminated, but that the outworking of sin in the physical body can potentially come to an end. Therefore, our body of sin can become transformed into a body of righteousness. To be done away, then, in this context, refers to the elimination of the power of sin which resides in the believer's body. The final clause in verse 6, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, indicates the purpose for which the body of sin is done away. The individual Christian, not yet having learned to have victory over the flesh or the sin nature, is viewed as enslaved to the principle of indwelling sin. When the physical body is released from the influence of the sin principle, the person is then freed from the, from the slavery. In other words, the door to the prison has been unlocked, so to speak, and the believer now has the ability to walk through it because he is no longer shackled and held prisoner by the sin principle. The simple statement in verse 7 summarizes and explains the results of the process of having died to the sin principle. For he who has died has been freed from sin states the new freedom that a person has, whether he understands it or not. This is not a statement of potential, but rather a statement of fact. All Christians, whether they realize this truth or not, have been freed from the sin principle. However, this does not hold true for the unsaved man or woman. Unsaved individuals have only, the, or have only one nature to live under, and that is their sin nature. The sin nature rules and reigns in their lives. That does not mean that every unsaved individual is involved with gross sin. Many of the, un, many of the unsaved are good, moral, law-abiding citizens who have no desire for God or the things of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, but they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. For those who are not saved, the things of the Spirit are foolishness, and they have no use for them. Romans 3, 10 through 12 elaborates on this. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God, all have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. None righteous, none who understands, and none who, seek, and none who seeks after God. This is God's assessment of the unsaved individual, which lives under the power and control of the sin nature. It is only when the unsaved when it's only when the unsaved believe the gospel and trust in Christ's death and resurrection for salvation is freedom from the sin nature achieved. Apart from that, they will remain in bondage to it. 
However, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are no longer in bondage or obligated to the sin nature. We have been completely set free from the obligation to sin. Thanks to Christ's death on the cross, we are no longer in debt to it. Colossians 2.14 says, Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decree, decrees, de decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. In Christ, we are now debt-free from the penalty of sin, and we now have every spiritual blessing in Christ, which includes Christ's righteousness also.